Mr. Manoj, can I talk about something? Uh, sure, please go ahead. I'm not sure. I think we are about to start uh, the session. So, yeah, I think maybe after it. Probably. So, what are you waiting for? We are still waiting for the moderator. Okay. Mr. Manoj? Okay. Yes, uh, Mr. Moin, uh, Professor Moin Nawar. Yes, uh, me, Gozali. Oh. How are you? You are in Hello? New Delhi now? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay, right. Okay. Salam. Hello, Mr. And Mr. Gozali, good morning. Oh, not clear. Sorry, we can't hear you properly. The voice is breaking. Yes, that's why. Okay. The song uh, is not clear, Mr. Reader. Wait. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, uh, test one, two, three. Still, oh, okay, right. still not clear. Yes, uh, it's audible. Okay, please. Hello, everyone. Good morning, or maybe good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to International Symposium to celebrate 20th birthday of Faculty of Social and Political Science, Universitas of Al Azhar, Indonesia. We are pleased to have you join us for this International Symposium to celebrate 20th birthday of Faculty of Social and Political Science of Universitas Al Azhar, Indonesia. <laughs> okay, uh, let's uh, get started. Okay. First, uh, let me let me introduce myself. My name is Wildan Faisal from the Department of IR, Universitas Al Azhar, Indonesia. I will be responsible for moderating this presentation session today. And I'm glad to welcome Mr. Manoj Kumar Panigrahi, who will present India Digitization Hit and Miss. And also Mr. Muhammad Fazali Hunawar, who will present Communication for Development and Democratization and Visioning Communication Study Through Hybrid Interaction. Thank you, Mr. Manoj and Mr. Fazali for joining us today. And I hope all is well. First, uh, let me explain to you short profile of our both speaker, Mr. Manoj and Mr. Fazali. First one, Mr. Manoj currently is Assistant Professor and Director of Center for Northeast Asian Studies at Jindal School of International Affairs, OP uh, Jindal Global University, India. And he is also non residential fellow at Taiwan Next Gen Foundation, Taipei. And he got his PhD from the Asia Pacific Studies program at National Changchi University in Taipei. And the second one, Mr. Mohammad Ghazali Punawar, is currently lecturer of communication science in OAI since 2012, and also head of international office OAI uh, since 2021. At the, at the same time, Mr. Kozali also PhD candidate in development communication science from Bogor Agricultural Institute. Before we begin this discussion, please please uh, allow me to explain a little about this today topic. Uh, for contem contemporary societies, digital democracy provides a key concept that denotes in our understanding that uh, the relationship between collective uh, self-government and mediating digital infrastructure. Uh, global political trend in recent years 
have put to rest any illusion that relationship between technological innovation and progress in democratic politics will be le- will be largely positive. Digital technology is dif- is disrupting international politics in many ways. To start it, bringing the new dimension to the author- authoritarian playbook, enabling government to more easily manipulate information consumed by citizens to monitor this and check political opponent and to censor communication. Democracy, meanwhile, a struggle to strike right, big, right balance between rewarding economic innovation and reaping the financial benefit of big, te- big technology company, while protecting user privacy, guarding against surveillance, misuse, and countering disinformation and hate speech. Okay. And for this session, yeah, each presenter, each speaker, today will have total 20 min- 25 minutes for their presentation. If one of our speaker complete their their presentation before their 25 minutes, so I, maybe I will turn into second speaker, or maybe after second speaker before 25 minutes up, maybe I will uh, turn into Q&A session. Okay. Uh, however, we will hold most question until the end of this session, and maybe I will uh, read the question out of lot for the present for the speaker to answer. Or maybe uh, from a participant can write the question in the chat box, okay? As time permit, okay? Okay. Uh, let's begin the discussion. This uh, discussion for the first speaker, Mr. Manoj Kumar. Time is yours. Uh, thank you, everyone. Namaste and uh, Salamat pagi <laughs> to everyone. And uh, yes, uh, so thank you for having me here. I'm going to speak uh, a bit about uh, India, where I'm from. And this is a topic that I'm not, I'm currently learning as well from this. And uh, my major interest is about Northeast Asia and to uh, also about Southeast Asia and East Asia. So I did some research about uh, uh, GAM and Ake and all those uh, conflicts in the region that happened a uh, long time back. So now I will be speaking something about uh, my, let's say, um, the uh, right, uh, the 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 digitization of uh, okay there is some problem with me sharing the screen okay there is a problem from my side uh, okay just a minute I'm not sure whether it can uh, take it or not. But if not, is it possible uh, for Mr. Yeah. Wilden to please share the my PPT? Okay, wait. Yeah, sorry, there is a problem. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I did some changes later on, but uh, it's okay. I'll use my uh, thing over here as well. Okay, sure. Okay, let's uh, let's begin. Sorry for a two minute delay from my side that occurred. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, today I'll be speaking about uh, India's digitization and uh, mostly the hits and misses uh, when it comes to the policies of India and. Uh, Yes, I am a currently uh, assistant professor and director at Jindal School of International Affairs uh, at OP Jindal Global University in India. So uh, moving on to our major topic, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think we talked about, we have our so Mr. Joshua from US Embassy. He spoke about digitization and uh, also about the disinformation warfare. So briefly, I'll be talking about those things. So my argument is uh, digitization is inevitable in any country and organizations around the world. Uh, it cannot be stopped. Uh, whether we, no matter how hard you try, you just cannot simply stay out of Uh, being yourself being digitized. Uh, for example, cell phones. It has become a a kind of um, a basic necessity to have a cell phone now. Uh, where with cell phone we have uh, online payments which help us to organize and track 
the payments easily. And with those cell phones also, we can make our calls, we can take pictures, we share our pictures and all those various usage and all. But there do occur also that it helps in multiple ways of to prevent dubious and unlawful transactions and dealings when it comes to the online transactions and payments when we talk about uh, let's say hawala rackets or say some illegal money transfer being done or somewhere where people are not able to uh, where, where people are not paying taxes so it helps in so called uh, uh, so called uh, things as such okay so and but again uh, such digitization also helps in higher income growth especially in the skill level section why because with digitization needs a greater education and recording in progress highly skilled labor as such as well where with the digitization comes where you uh, tell your students tell your citizens to be more digitally aware where they can going to read more about some how to use uh, some digital devices so it has become a necessity these days and again um, i'm sure everybody have listened and heard about uh, the mobile payments and now whatsapp has come out with its own mobile payment we have amazon pay google pay uh, all those uh, china has a wonderful wechat pay all those things where we don't involve cash that has been a change of transformation the debit cards the credit cards are something that is being very unique is by itself and also through digitization we have also i personally love watching movies so i feel very great uh, that when we have uh, websites like netflix which have its which has led to empowerment of so many people the rise of v vfx using in movies okay so these things have been a very much critical when it comes to the digitization of a country or a society but when it comes to india when when it comes to india i will tell you when the things got beginning was uh, netflix plus um next next slide next slide please arif uh mm. next slide arif yes yes yeah uh wait uh, yeah sure so when it comes to digitization the first thing happened was in 2012 okay and so it's it, it was in 2012 that is where uh, the indian uh, society or the indian government was kindly more or less shaken up uh, when it comes to the one small incident that i would like to focus on yes can we move to the next slide thanks okay so this is famously if you google this uh, you will famously uh, find out uh, this one has been termed as north east exodus what is north east exodus it was something that occurred in 2012 when the whatsapp was very new to indian society to the indian public it was that there were multiple unverified whatsapp forwards that came into cell phones targeting a particular section of a city in bangalore bangalore is a city in the south of india and they were targeted. so some of these whatsapp messages kind of focused on that northeast east north northeast indian people especially uh, the from assam nagaland arunachal pradesh those seven states of india of north now who is residing in bangalore they those people were being targeted in those whatsapp saying that there are multiple uh, attacks and some of them have died already in 2012 that whatsapp and lot of thousands of people believed it so what caused that created a panic among the north east asian north east indian people uh, in india and it created a people started to flee back home they started to use the trains so started to take the flights or by road by any means but it created a severe pressure on the railway and other critical infrastructure later on when the things when there was a big investigation that occurred by the government of india at that then government of india it was found out that it was not something true it was something that was a fake news that was being circulated on whatsapp i'm sure we all have got this kind of messages you forward this email uh, forward this message to 10 people then the god will god will bless you 
we all have got this kind of messages or we have got this kind of messages where uh, we say that you have got a lottery of say um, thousands of um, dollars you have won so please connect to it so that's something that is um, being uh, that created a panic and that when the government of india got re um, really aware that there is something called such that whatsapp forwards can be also used as a technical tool i won't go much about northeast exodus what happened after that because it's a completely separate story what we'll go is then in the next slide please okay so what happens is the digital india campaign that was something that began in 2015 it was started on launch 1st of July, 2015. And at that time of launch, when we began this uh, Digital India campaign, it was only about 19% of the population was connected to the internet. And imagine a country of 1.3 billion people and only 19% of the person or the uh, population is connected to the internet. So it shows a big major gap of usability of cell phones and the uses of internet. And out of this, only 15% had internet um, cell phone penetration at that time. Considering as, as a, but it again, Digital India, what it did, it, it did, well, there were several other government schemes, such as national governance in 2006, national optical fiber network uh, in 2011, unique identification, commonly known as Aadhaar card, where the all the citizens of India will be getting a ID with a unique number on it so these things digital india kind of try to incorporate all of this uh, policies different policies into one umbrella that is called digital india campaign and many uh, uh, critics many scholars did say that okay fine it is there so but what are the objectives of it so one of the first objective that uh, from this digital india campaign that came out was connecting rural areas with internet India has a massive population which stays in the rural side. Um, so that was the aim to connect them to the internet, to bring them to the internet mainstream, improving digital literacy. And the third is inclusive growth in digital infrastructure, governance and services, and empowerment of citizens. Digital literacy, as I mentioned before, that how to behave on the internet is something which is very much important. And we uh, in the earlier sessions of this today's uh, conference, uh, that has also been covered multiple things on it. And the third part is where the inclusive growth in digital infrastructure. It's where people can easy access to internet so that they can access the governments and services where they can file uh, complaints, file, ask for some services, file for certificates, file for uh, to check where this application process is. So this is something that is was uh, the aim of Digital India. And due to this kind of increase of governance and services, it also helps in uh, empowerment of its citizens as well. Okay, uh, next, next slide, please. So, but again, uh, what happened? Uh, this is something I'm sure uh, most of you must have heard, uh, demonetization. It is the demonetization occurred in, on November 8, 2016, uh, where it is happened when uh, currencies of 500 Indian rupees and 1000 Indian rupees were demonetized, where they, they were withdrawn by the government saying that it don't have any value. Let's say you have 5000 rupees of 1000 denomination and of five different currencies, then those 1000 rupees, the five 5000 rupees will not be considered as a money anymore overnight. So it also occurred that no matter, you can also go and exchange, but it created a lot of troubles to the people. But also during this demonetization at the time when the prime minister at during 2016, uh, prime minister Narendra Modi, he came out with this announcement also that there will be an issuance of new 500 and 2000 Indian rupees into the market or into the society. So what was the main objectives of this demonetization is to curtail shadow economy. Okay, uh, shadow economy that where most of the people um, uh, were not paying taxes, that how the money is being, trans being transferred was not being able to be tracked to each other. 
So it, it helped in creating a cashless transaction. Okay, so before this, we uh, Indians used to always prefer to use cash. You know, it is whether you uh, order something from online, it was mostly on cash on delivery basis. Okay, but uh, this demonetization aimed to increase the cashless uh, transactions. And it helps to reduce the use of cash to fund illegal activity and terrorism, where money could also be tracked and money could also be uh, funded as well. Okay, money could uh, be tracked and uh, so that if there is a illegal transaction, let's say if there's one terror group, we India do face a lot of challenges. So where one of this terror group is funding or being funded through somebody or somewhere, it can be easily tracked to its origin. So this sort of uh, things was what was aimed by the demonetization by the government at that time, in the beginning. Okay, now uh, let's uh, move to the next. Yeah. So what it created, it created a massive disruption of banking services, uh, lengthy queues at the banks to exchange money uh, and job loss. Uh, according to multiple reports uh, around the India and by multiple organizations, there were approximately 1.5 million jobs were lost. And most of these jobs were not high income jobs because high income jobs was very transparent where you can see like being money is being transferred from bank to bank, okay? But the criticism where I could say is it was very poorly planned and executed. It was a wonderful idea, but again, it was very poorly planned and executed. Uh, that created uh, lengthy queues and most of the people who uh, were in the queue, some of them uh, died for some other reasons, was standing for too long, health, those people who were standing for too long due to health issues, they also, some of them lost their lives. But again, it also created a massive job loss and that also helped in um, creating a more number of problems um, into the society that was already facing. Okay, uh, especially the people who are from daily wage workers, those who used to survive on daily wage, like the construction workers, uh, maintenance workers, uh, all those bases, all those people, they were not able to find any job because all of a sudden their bosses or those people who were supposed to give them money with mostly they were being paid with 500 rupees or 1000 rupees, they were unable to pay back. They were unable to pay to the daily wage workers. So they it created and getting money, the new money from the bank was creating a lot of time and it was a lot of disruption because imagine to supply money to 1.3 billion people of overnight your money got uh, and, uh, and was invalid and then you have to go into the banks for queue and there were queues from morning three overnight queues um, to get exchange money for for your from your old money to the or new money as such okay but again uh, it helped in multiple things but one of the Critical thing that came out of this demonetization, next slide please, was uh, something which we call, uh, or the government calls here is Unified Payment Interface. It is called UPI, okay? It was something that was launched on 11th of April, 2016. And um, it was then when it is something that you can see on the image uh, that you see there's a local, uh, local T-shop. I got this in, uh, image from the internet. Uh, on the on Google search and one of the this is a very common site where you can see uh, there is small white board right, uh, right in front of that uh, person who is standing and you can see there is a QR code on it. So what this UPI does is that it creates a unique ID for every person of who is a holder of a bank account and through that QR so I can use my cell phone scan the QR code that will take me to my uh, payment service, the mobile app. To, I personally use my bank's app or any other third party app. I can scan that QR, select the money, how much I want to pay. And instantly, I, and then I will show the money is gone instantly to the, uh, to the shopkeeper. So it helped in so much, it helped in this digital payments. So that created a massive number uh, of uh, payment that could be tracked. And it helped in a uh, lot of bogus transactions. Again, in, through this QR code, you can only pay to a certain amount of money, not beyond of a certain amount of limit. Uh, because it's also helped in 
of transactions. Small, small tea shop guy. You, it's a very common site. So I was in Taiwan until February this year. So when I came back to India uh, for after a very long time, I could see UPI and it's everywhere. And I hardly use cash in India now. I hardly use cash. Before my experience was very different because I had to bring in cash. Sometimes I have to run for changes and such. But UPI is something that changed lives of millions in India. And uh, September by, as of September 2022, UPI is accepted by 350 banks that is there in India. And it is also being accepted in eight countries, including Singapore, France, uh, Oman, UAE, Saudi, uh, Nepal, uh, Bhutan, all these countries. And there are more uh, more uh, conversation to increase it to other countries as well. That I won't go. But again, this UPI also brings a lot of challenges, such as if there is no internet connection, what is what are the solutions to it? If there is no Wi-Fi, if there is, let's say, uh, the payment sometimes, the, it is digital, right? It cannot be 100% correct all the time. So if there is a, a failure of payment of uh, through this, what are the alternatives? What are the alternatives if somebody don't have cash at that time and wants to go only digital payments. So that solution has not been there yet. And that is something is one of the critical challenge to this kind of uh, digital payments and the digital, uh, one of the misses of uh, things. Can you go to the next? Okay, so uh, this are some of the uh, data that I would like to show you uh, that again, that was from the National Payment Corporation of India which is the leading or the nodal agency to map out the digital payments of being done in India. Um, the, in 2016, the, you can see only 0.26% of the total transaction that was happening in India was through UPI, through the QR code cards that I could uh, that issue. But by the year of 2021, it is massive. It is about 3,418 uh, million dollars almost that came out as such of uh, digital payments. So it is there, but a lot of things to be done on this part. But again, um, there also brings a lot of challenges such as, so when this um, uh, this uh, policy was came out, there was a lot of uh, speculations by different agencies that it won't happen, it won't be done. Yes, that is there. Like there are all this, nothing is perfect, I would say. Uh, but it gave a lot of opportunities uh, to the Indian uh, society or the Indian government uh, to, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm saying I'm very optimistic about this uh, UPI payments and it helped it give opportunities, opportunities as such how this opportunities was came on. Opportunities came such as digitization could increase jobs in the high tech sector that I mentioned before that it is very crucial to uh, the society to develop, to change with the changing time. Semiconductor manufacturing in collaboration with like-minded countries. Semiconductors is something that is crucial. I'm um, um, the leading country for semiconductors is Taiwan. And this is where India has been trying to um, uh, form partnerships and to have more investments in semiconductors in the country manufacturing of semiconductors to the chips that will be the next generation of um, the society where we are moving from uh, uh, where we are moving from fossil fuel to ev vehicles uh, semiconductors uh, let's say are crucial for our cell phones for laptops for anything these days that we are talking about okay Rising awareness of government policies in accessing information and connecting. And it also helps, digitization also helps in pushing the government policies towards to the grassroots level. And it also helps people at the grassroots levels to connect with the government and its policies. And cooperation in data security and storage. That is very much crucial when it comes to the, you know, when it comes to the, uh, uh, this, uh, let's say between the countries of between two different countries or multi countries where we can have this kind of uh, cooperation of sharing of information uh, sharing of bo bogus uh, talks bogus uh, payments uh, that has been happening so these are some of the opportunities where i could see that um, if all the countries can do and 
should look forward to. Okay, but again, uh, there are a lot of challenges uh, when we call about uh, digitizations in India. One of the first is, uh, can we move to that last slide, please? Uh, sorry, the next slide, the next slide, the ninth one. Five minutes yeah. left, Manash. Yeah, 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 sure, thanks. Uh, yeah. So the challenges are bureaucracy, where um, Indian bureaucracy is being termed as something which is uh, very uh, hard to go through. Uh, second will be identifying and combating fake news. With rising of usage of digital uh, devices, we uh, extensively, Mr. Joshua from US uh, Embassy talked about uh, fake news and how to identify and combat data information and information security, where how secure our information is online. That is something need to be thought of. Uh, there are legal challenges to it. Let's say, what if your data is being misused and what if the user or like people like us uh, come across uh, some legal loopholes that we couldn't fight against the data breach of ours. Digital literacy is something that we all need to work on. And again, uh, if no matter what, we uh, digital is something that has been changing and it, it will keep on changing. So we have to keep ourselves up to date with the changes, at least some basic knowledge of digital literacy. Next will be the disinformation warfare that is being talked about and is similar to the fake news. Um, uh, for example, during COVID time that we just faced for this extensive uh, two years, two and a half years, the world grappled with the COVID. And so do it also grapple with fake news that you eat this, your COVID will go away. You drink this, this uh, COVID virus will go away. COVID is nothing but something, uh, something which black magic or something. This kind of fake news should not be encouraged. And if such thing, a government has should and must be responsible to combat such kind of disinformation. Not only government, government should work together with the civil society organizations, NGOs, universities, um, and also the private industry players. Because if such fake news comes out, then it will be a troublesome and it will be a bad to the society. Just like the thing that I mentioned in the earlier that is the Northeast Exodus. So this is where I am going to stop. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm be more than happy to take about, and um, we can discuss this. And uh, I will finish my uh, talk right now. Thank you. I think I'm under the time and I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Manoj. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, my sound is clear. Okay, my sound is clear, okay. Okay, uh, I I noticed uh, uh, something in and in, in first thing in Mr. Man presentation, especially about digital India. Yeah, uh, I know this digital India just uh, was launched by Narendra Modi maybe like seven years ago uh, to purpose empower the people of the country digitally. Yeah, digital India campaign was launched uh, with uh, aim purpose to bridge uh, India digital segment and the solicit investment in the te technology sector. Yeah, and uh, also Digital India uh, also hope can uh, give voice to the voiceless and maybe allow to mar marginalized community to have to the ease of access when it comes to the internet to help them overcome their environment poverty through digital empowerment. Yeah. Uh, I think same case with Indonesia also being being digitally able has been empirically empirically asset of India or Indonesia as well, and I think also happen in maybe happen in all country, uh, especially like India and Indonesia. However, however, this race, this issue of a digital divide. That exists in many countries like India and Indonesia. Uh, <clears throat> maybe I will not talk too long. Uh, I will turn into the second speaker today, Mr. Gozali Munawar. Okay, uh, time is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wildan. Uh, give me opportunity to deliver for uh, some point that I have already uh, prepared in my presentation. Please, uh, the committee, help me to operate my slide, please.
please. Okay. Wait a second, Mr. Fasali. Okay. Uh, okay, right. With writing on the committee operate on my slide, uh, I would like to introduce myself, uh, Mr. Manu, and all colleagues in the Zoom, Zoom meeting that I, I was uh, involved in the University of Al Azhar from 2000 actually, and I involved in communication department, the philosophy, uh, on uh, communication department and faculty of social and political science uh, since 2012. And now that uh, uh, already, how many years? Uh, uh, 10 years, uh, 10 years ago. Okay. Please, sir, uh, the committee, any problem? Okay. <clears throat> وبعد الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ثم ما بعد. Continuing the the discussion, the presentation before that we hear and we learn more from Mr. Man of Kumar regarding digitalization in India. I would like to present my paper based on our experience in University of Alazhar, Indonesia regarding communication department. That uh, why I take uh, this uh, uh, topic communication for development and democratization, envisioning communication study through hybrid interaction. I'm so sorry, I have uh, prepared my slide at 23. So uh, please, uh, moderator, uh, help me that uh, if I need so long time to explain my presentation. For uh, Effective and more efficient my presentation, I divided uh, the six, uh, six points. Uh, first, the uh, background, the second, a uh, study arm and certain method of study, and a fourth of the view and a data analysis and discussion and closing and recommendation. This slide, next slide. Okay. Why we are talking about communication for development and democratization has interests to promote human rights and development and culture. And this is a three topic that uh, if, if we are talking about democratization, development in, uh, for example, in developing countries, in developed countries also, that three topic is uh, very important that regarding a communication for development and democratization versus human right, development and culture. That I have mentioned before that we are concerned, uh, we have trying to make uh, communication development is very focused. That how to make communication department in the University of Lazar, especially media and journalism, advertising and public relation contribute to me and contribute involved in communication for development and democratization. That we are very, uh, I think that based on our experience to talk, uh, from 2000 and 2002 and, and 2022, that the communication department, especially media and journalism and, and advertising and public relations has a complacing this responsibility. But uh, there is lack of understanding of the complexities of the IFR, social and cultural factor. So why we are the need for adoption and learning process through hybrid interaction, especially for communication science, Islamic values. When we are, are talking about uh, hybrid interaction, especially with concern in communication science and Islamic values, this is, this is the verse of the foundation of the hybrid when we would like to implement this university. This slide, the next slide. Okay. 
Oh, for answer, that's uh, the problem statement. So this study, uh, to aim uh, to investigate a valuable principle and practices of communication for development and democracy in learning process in University Al Azhar, Indonesia. And its second uh, aim is to analyze the challenges in implementation of communication for development and democratization through hybrid interaction in according in according to the vision of the university. Please slide, slide please. Okay, method of study uh, that I have already mentioned before that I have involved in this communication department from 2012. I know the structure of communication department regarding communication for development and democratization. So I use out on ethnography was used to investigate the implementation of communication for development and democratization. The study was strengthened by in-depth interview with selected informa. The study employed descriptive design by qualitative data, authoritative secondary data and the data from study of media and journalism, advertising and public relation during learning process in University Al Azhar Indonesia. That this is why this focus in my, uh, my method that I use auto ethnography and based my experience in learning process in media journalism, advertising and public relation. This slide, next slide please. Okay, overview. Uh, communication for development or C4D. Communication for development is tool for social and political transformation. It promotes participation and social change using method and instrument of interpersonal communication, community media, and modern information technologies. That's why this is concern that we are talking about communication for development. If we are moved to undevelop, to develop, so the tool is communication for development. Please slide. Next slide. And we are talking about communication for democratization. The idea for communication for democratization can be linked with classical political liberalism its conception of individual freedom and the idea of the public sphere. In this sense, the communication for democratization represents the reinterpretation of liberalism in context of the, the information society and later media society that we learn together from uh, Professor Joshua and Dr. Manu that digitalization now is very expand in every country. So, Communication for democratization is the reinterpretation of liberalism in the context of information society and later media society. This slide, Nick, next slide, please. So, uh, based on uh, my search on, uh, with the systematic review and bibliometric, that communication for development and democratization bans on systematic review. So it has strategic role for social change, society in all type of government or organization. That all, that our concern that communication for development and democratization based on the literature review, based on systematic review, that it has strategic role that if we need social change, so the communication for development and democracy is suitable. Please nicely, next slide. Please, nice slide. Next slide. Okay. Uh, before that, uh, I would like uh, no milestone. Uh, 
uh, before that, uh, please. Milestone. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, if we are refer to the history that uh, Mr. Manu and Professor Joshua mentioned that digitalization have uh, embraced all situation and civilization. So we are uh, refer to the history that the communication revolution, uh, the beginning from top down uh, till, uh, from 1960 in start with modernization that uh, the beginning of the modernization of our technology, especially in ICT. And then after that, uh, in 1970, uh, still all, uh, has already uh, has changed the dependency theory and the butter up. And, and then after that, in 1980, horizontal and multipolar. So based on uh, Paulo Freire and the pedagogy of oppressed, this is the kind of the participation movement. The participation movement we call with uh, communication development is a three paradigm. And from 1990 in the digital revolution, and now we span it in all institutions, or organization, and all our life colored by the digital revolution. And, and, and after that, 2000 and global digital, and now we are in uh, what summit on the information society. And, and we are used also, and we enjoy with the social media bomb but this is uh, actually the from uh, 2010. This is all the information that regarding the history and the chronologies of about the revolution of digital or about the communication that we mentioned here, milestone of communication for development. Please, slide, next slide, next slide, please. So we are, uh, go back to, the three topic that communication development and democratization regarding human rights and development and culture. So why we are talking about hybrid interaction? The DNA, the foundation of hybrid interaction that the communication development already promote and already develop. Firstly, in human rights. Human rights development and culture are a continuously evolving concept. Human rights have become universalized and value subject to interpretation, negotiation, and accommodation. Uh, especially if we, are, if we are talking about democratization, the first thing that if we are not accept it is human right, but many interpretation, negotiation, and accommodation. And the second topic that regarding communication for development and democratization is development. How compatible is universal normative approach to development? So all institution, all organization talking about development. So with respect to the right of the people and communities to self-determination, as well as with respect to organization autonomy. And so if we are talking about communication for development and democratization, human rights and development and culture is set is in culture. Human rights, development and culture are interdependent. So there is the relation with the human rights and development. Interdependent phenomena which should not be spread in practice. Individuals are not only object and human rights and development, but at active agent participation and constitution this phenomena through their interaction with other culture. That all why we say hybrid interaction in the in earth or in chronology and the first, the beginning of the concept communication for demo, uh, demo, uh, development and democratization. Please, uh, next, next slide. So uh, go back with the uh, that I have mentioned before. Uh, we are. Uh, we have the experience that uh, we have uh, so long, so long time, and we have along the journey of the experience of hybrid nature in communication sign with Islamic values. How to interaction? 
how to interact, hybrid interaction and reconfession the context for communication for development and democratization based on Islamic institution like University Al Azhar Indonesia. Firstly, tradition and modernity. Uh, second, university and relativism, and third, individualism and collectivism. Modernization has introduced human rights and conventional concept and development. The way Islamic law and human rights discourse have met in recent years, any good example, and how hybridization really work. The university and rel relativism, the universality of human rights and rejected the notion of cultural relativism, relativism, Islam approach life and its problem in that totally being a complete brief for party reform or compromise solution. And individualism and collectivism, the individualism, collectivism, dichotomy can be linked to another set of pressure opposite first person, second generation right. Individualism and collectivism from Islamic viewpoint are not to opposite concept, but are to intervene, percept, com complementing, enhancing each other. Please, next, next slide. So uh, we are talking now that after overview, method of study and uh, background, data analysis and discussion. First said that uh, we show you the division of the University of Al-Azhar Indonesia is uh, embedded with hybrid interaction to become leading university. It's based on development, excellent and dignified person who have intellectual capability based on Islamic, spiritual, moral, and ethical values. This next slide, because we are, okay. So uh, I'm sure you that uh, based on uh, my uh, discussion with the selected uh, in uh, selected informant and uh, secondary data and all the document that already uh, already used in University of Al Azhar Indonesia. First, uh, if you are talking about communication for de development and democratization, uh, first we are concerned in promoting human rights uh, through education. That all this is uh, uh, the important thing. Uh, we have for all our uh, all a link and all the capacity building based on promoting human rights through education. And second one, uh, if we are talking about the development, if we are, uh, we, are, we are doing also mobilization for development through a program and oriented, even oriented. And third, uh, that uh, I have mentioned before that uh, regarding a topic about the communication for development is uh, a culture. So we are trying to make a building culture with access to information and knowledge for all. That all, this is the important thing. And the fourth, the important thing, after we are talking about human rights, mobilization and development and building and culture, so we determine that good governance among students and already there. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. The challenge is the implementation communication for development and democracy in learning process in hybrid nature. That I have uh, mentioned before that this university actually implement hybrid nature. So the, the challenges, the first challenge regarding the communication is religion as being a factor, is binding a factor enables human to understand themselves through communication and transmit information of any kind within the society with their life. Mm -hmm. So if we are learn more about how about the relationship between religion and communication. And second one, especially that uh, we are focused in concentration in communication about the media and journalism. If religion and media not ex are expanded from the real notion of social institution to wider concept of domain, the sustained tension as the domain of evaluating, labeling, measuring, pricing, and condemning. That this is all that we are show that in this uh, digital era, we show that uh, Dr. Manur Khuner always uh, explain us 
about fake news or that this is the kind of the impact of how the relationship between religion and media has to contribute. And third one is uh, regarding about the advertising. Religion plays a significant role in influencing social and consumer behavior. This influence and intensity of belief has attitude toward the adver advertising of particular controversial product and services. This is a kind of relating with advertising. And the fourth is uh, regarding uh, public religion that building mutually useful relationship between religion and their societies involve the best use of communication and good public relation. Please, next slide. So uh, we are talking that investing communicative study through hybrid interaction based on the implementation uh, human right uh, development and culture, and how to make a hybrid interaction run in the uh, university in Indonesia. Please, next, uh, next slide. Uh, this is what can. Uh, why, uh, why I, I produce you, so I recommend it about the infisoning. Infisoning is mean imagine future possibility. So based on um, based on uh, the research and uh, uh, on the literature and implementation and our experience. So uh, we are trying to make uh, how the, the intellectual discourse uh, talking about the interaction uh, model uh, between media, journalism, and Islam Islamic values. We propose you based on our bibliometric uh, study and a uh, voice uh, fear that the other complementary model is very suitable with the uh, study on media and journalism and Islamic uh, Islamic values. This is what uh, what have we done? What uh, have we done uh, uh, regarding hybrid interaction model on media and journalism and Islamic values? Uh, please, next slide. And best. Uh, on our experience also that uh, uh, after searching an uh, Google a Google Scholar and regarding intellectual discourse, uh, first fear that show us that there is a, there is a relationship between advertising and Islamic values. Uh, otherwise, uh, Islam is uh, more significant, uh, and the other one is advertising is very focused in, for example, in a business activity at, at, at all. So the suitable for the hybrid interaction model is dialogue. Please. Okay. Sorry, three minutes okay. left. Okay. okay. Uh, three slide, please. And after that, uh, this is the best on our experience on hybrid interaction on public relation and Islamic values. Because we are talking about uh, public relation that focus on management function with uh, institution to the public, with organization to the public. So need uh, internal dimension, external dimension individual dimension and social dimension. So this is uh, suitable based on the bloomerated study that first fuel show us that the tragic model is suitable for higher interaction on public relation is in an Islamic values. Okay, please. Na next slide, please. So closing and recommendation based on our study and based on our experience and our, the journey of communication department from 2002 and 2012 and 2022 that we are now, and we are very uh, kind of to promote that infusioning community study in hybrid nature is evident but student benefit only if communication for development and democratization is practices through hybrid interaction properly. 
The second one is the challenges were identified in the study have to be overcome with determination, appropriate approach and research, and also sufficient support to strengthen Islamic high education responsive to a social change and political transformation. And so this uh, kind of the recommendation based on um, my study in this uh, topic, three model of hybrid instruction should be delivered in learning process with considering the structure of communication concentration that we have we have to know that every subject, every concentration have philosophy, uh, philosophy and had background. So theodic dialogue is, is suitable for media and journalism and theodic complementary is suitable for advertising and theodic suitable for public relation. That's all my presentation. And I hope we can discuss together regarding this uh, topic communication for democracy De uh, development and democratization in visioning communication study through hybrid interaction based on UAE experience. Thank you, moderator, Mr. Ridan, for giving me you are time welcome. to present. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, you are welcome, Mr. Ghazali. Uh, okay. I point out the special special words in the Mr. Ghazali's presentation: communication for democracy. Yeah. Communication as prerequisite for democracy. Strong communication in government get trust in the citizen. And the hope is that trust will inspire the citizen to become involved in their communities. As the relationship builds between the government and citizen, over time, the time and citizen will come to realize that their concern matter. Yeah. The community engagement keep citizen. Uh, keep informed on the project that affect their texts and their life, their, their lives. Citizens gain as uh, assurance that their local government will is will prepared to handle emergency. Uh, it's also engagement also helps to inform voters about their choice at the polls polling station. Okay, uh, I will open the Q and Q and A session, and uh, I think uh. For our chimes, uh, we can open for the three question uh, for all participants. Uh, if you want to give question to the our board speaker today, Mr. Manas and Mr. Fozali, you can uh, turn on uh, turn on your Zoom account, your uh, to speak, or also maybe you can write down in the chat box. I can maybe I can explain to you. Uh, I can speak out. To your question to the our speaker <clears throat> okay uh want to ask you can raise your hand first maybe i want to ask uh mr wildan uh, permission okay. bimo okay. explain your name and your institution my institution is uh Chai uh, 20, uh, international relations major in uh, UAE. And I want to ask uh, about uh, the, um, the speakers. First, I want to ask about the India. How, how is in India protect uh, the algorithm of uh, their own security on the public data and also the, um, the government data? So, uh, in Indonesia, there is a bridge. There is a lot of bridge of uh, hack data, like like I mean, like um, um KPU, like um, uh, 1.3 million, one one three three one point three. Um, no, no, no. I mean, I mean, like the whole app, 1.3 million uh, data that people uh, have already with the own ID, and um, there were security bridge. Uh, his name is Bjorka, and he's explained about something. Uh, Mundir Said Talib was uh, assassinated by um, Mati, uh, Pali Corpus, but Pali Corpus is not the one, uh, uh, not the one who um, acceptable, apa namanya, uh, responsible. But but uh, he's explaining someone is uh, Mukwadi Mukwadi Muhammad Mukwadi or or what, and it's and it's uh, yeah. And um, my second question is uh, about the community. Uh, so the community about about the community is um i think what is the gap so my my own grandfather is uh, told me to be told me uh, a story they, they were 
um, my grandfather is a lecturer in UNAS. Um, so he told me he visited uh, India one time and, and I want to know about the gap between the rich and the poor and also the case because he meeting someone in the India who case, who case was low was Sudra. I think Sudra, Brahmana, Vaisha and Bra uh, Brahmana and it is Sudra. But he is the doctor with the doctor degree. But but with the doctor degree, he's already what bit uh Sorry, like you, a, can um, you pull up in the one great when similar question yeah. for the second so, question? Oh so yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to I want to ask about the gap about the so exactly my grandfather is uh, experiencing about the whole the whole uh, in India. It's a seminar and and uh, they were very sick, very very uh, very very not hygiene, very very not hygiene, very crowded. And I think the the, the they were in degree the, the degree was high was doctor the degree was high doctor but the case so low sudra but the case so low sudra and this one is like the like a poor man it's a small small house. And sitting on the chair, right? But okay. I want, I want to this about the gap now. But the case, the case like okay. that. And this is my second question. So, so it's that it from uh, first question and second question. Okay, thank you, Bimo. Okay, uh, I think that uh, both question from Bimo is uh, to Mr. Manoj. Yeah? The first question is about how, uh, how India protect or uh, the data, the privacy data from. Uh, from their people, be more related to the our our case, Indonesia case. Maybe like some weeks ago, we have like uh, outbreak, like uh, some big breach uh, from our polling 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 office. Uh, they have, uh, they have they they got attacked from the our famous hacker, like call them Jorka like that, and it's raised concern about our security the data in, in in Asia, our identity, our tax number, our uh, phone card, or that like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe Hanoj can uh, answer sure. or first. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Faisal, for moderating the session. And uh, thanks, Bimo, for your questions. Uh, coming to the first one of data security and protection, OK? Uh, I would say uh, this is a challenge for every country, every society, not uh, not only the um, corporate, uh, even to the corporate as well, the private players in the industry as well. Uh, one key thing that you can do is uh, one India is doing is to asking uh, companies like Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, all those countries, all those companies to have the servers in India. Okay the mother servers in India. So that helps in a lot of way to um, kind of a protection of data. Like nobody can physically access them. But again, there are definitely, uh, there are a lot of laws on how to those data can be accessed, even by the government. There are particular laws. The uh, Supreme Court do come out with a lot of amendments in different laws on time to time. And uh, the hacker community, again, um, uh, in India, the hackers are being divided into two ones. Uh, I'm not sure about other countries. Uh, usually, the hackers are being called as uh, blue hacker and the uh, white hackers. Uh, the white hackers are the ones which are being uh, employed by the government or they work on freelance for the government and they are legitimate. And those who are illegitimate, yes, they have been, been arrested. And there are also rise of cyber security police stations around India and almost now every police station have one or two personals who are trained in cyber security so and also a lot of universities uh, around are trying to uh, come out with uh, more and more courses so that the students could also study more about cyber security which is uh, very much important and uh, coming to your second question about gap between rich and poor uh, those car system and all i don't think this is the right platform to talk about it and uh, especially uh, we, when we are talking about digitization, yes, it has to be reached out to across uh, rich or whether it's poor, it doesn't matter. But again, uh, coming to your car system, just for your uh, uh, thing, I would say uh, before you read about the cast, please read about uh, Varna system. Uh, that is, uh, it has been mentioned in Bhagavad Gita uh, as well. In chapter 4, verse 13, if you look at, uh, 
please look at it and i won't be speaking much about this thing right now here uh, and by law the constitution says it's illegal and the the history of caste system the things that you mentioned uh, it has its own topic it needs another 3 hours of discussions and debates so i'll skip that and uh, over to you mr faisal thank you again yep okay thank you mr manoj uh, maybe we have uh, one question one question left maybe uh, i would like oh, okay. to okay mr Al okay i'll okay. spend your name and your decision first okay my name is abdul muhammad Muhammad Abdul Ramadan from uh, International International Relations Study Program, Al Azhar Indonesia University. I would I would like to ask uh, to Mr. Manoj. Uh, as you know, the Bangalore was an amazing city, like a Silicon Valley. I you know. Nah, I want to ask you, uh, how do Bangalore save the data, save the society data? How the Bangalore save uh, society data from the hack who cracking down the society the, the society data? The, as you know, uh, the Silicon Valley, as, as you know, this, the Silicon Valley uh, did the same too, did the same too. And how the Bangalore made it? How the Bangalore did, did it? Just it. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, your voice was cutting. I couldn't hear. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Alvi, can you? Can you speak again about your question? Can you your me about the, yeah, please. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my son is audible. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, as you know, uh, the Bangalore it, it was a amazing city like a Silicon Valley. Uh, I want to ask you about the Bangalore. How the Bangalore save uh, the date, the society data from the hacker who hack who cracking down who hack uh. The society data as uh, okay. like a Silicon Valley, like a Silicon okay. Valley can uh, did the same too. Yeah, and how the Bangalore uh, did it to it? Just... Okay, um, okay. Thank you, thank you for your question. I think I got the answer. Okay. First, uh -huh. I have never been to Bangalore. It's very, very far from where I am at or uh, wherever my home is. It's I've never been there, so I don't know. But again, um. See, uh, when we talk about Silicon Valley and all as such, uh, Bangalore is a city, one of the cities uh, which have so many companies from other places, right? Uh, the service industry and all. I think it's not particularly to Bangalore. It can be anything. That's the, that's the beauty of uh, this uh, uh, digitalization, right? Or this uh, digital age that you don't need to be somewhere to be somewhere. Like you can, uh, hackers mostly use VPNs, right? And things so it may look like you are from bangalore you are doing it but you may be sitting in um just for sake uh jakarta or somewhere right so it can be anywhere so it have to be um again uh this is a continuous process and the companies and the countries uh like if i'm a university i have my students data online my faculty's data online i need to hire one or two cyber security officials who are really good at it I need to invest on it because the cost of the data getting leaked is much higher than what the cost that you are going to hire them at for. Okay, so how much is the accepted cost that the companies or the universities or the government is ready to accept is something which needs to be looked at. Uh, what is the cost you are going to pay? Are you ready to pay $100 million before the hacking happens or are you ready to pay $500 million after the hacking? So it's uh, up to the person. I'm not the boss, so uh, it's up to the bosses who are going to do it. So I hope you uh, I answered your question. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you uh, for your thank question. Thank you, Mr. Thank you so okay. much. Uh, maybe I can conclude like our our yachts yacht in in the Indonesia yachts uh, Indonesia colonial yeah often here Bangalore city in in our news because one of uh, our maybe. Maybe our biggest, uh, biggest taxi platform online, taxi platform online, uh, Gojek. Maybe you you heard Gojek. Yeah. They they open their office in Bangalore. So like surprise many of us. Like, why why Bangalore? Why Bangalore? After we oh. digging up some news, yeah. Oh Bangalore, I know we we already didn't know Bangalore is a city of Silicon Valley in India. <laughs> we treat like that. It's okay. Uh uh. I have special news. 
uh, for this for this room, I maybe I can give one another question for participant in this room. You maybe want to ask. You can raise your hand first in your room. Anas. Okay. Okay. If there is no, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, maybe. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think Bimo, you can keep your 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 choice to your your chance to your friend. I think. Oh, Asa, we end. Okay, Asa. Um, hello. Can I have a you, question. Explain your, sorry, explain your name first and your institution. Oh, my name is Asa Biandri, and I study international relation. And my question is about hacker groups. Uh, do you think hacker groups like Anonymous or people like Bjorka should be considered vigilante or someone who want to wreck chaos? That's it. Sorry. Okay. Maybe it's about opinion, not creation, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I think India and Indonesia also have some problem like uh, the hacker uh, growing anonymously and growing by. It's quality and quantity, I think, just mm. some our some surface. Okay, uh, I think it's enough for this room. Uh, but before before we back to the main room, we need to take a photo together. I think we will guide by our uh, our Zoom administrator, maybe Mr. Ari. Okay. Uh, can all participants open their camera first? We want to take picture. Okay, okay. Mm. Oops, it's, it's 11 slides. Mr. Harib, you want to take 11 slides or just in the first first or second slide? I think all if this 11 slide is too long, I just realized there are 262 participants. Okay, all all the slides, okay. <laughs> Mr. Harib, uh, so you can maybe, you can count uh, or me on the... Okay, yeah, for the first know. slide. Oh, Jut, maybe I want to come. <laughs> okay. Okay, I will call the I will call the, the first the the first slide. Okay. Uh one, two, three. Okay, done. Okay, to move to the second slide. Participant, can you open the camera, please? It's okay if you are still in cafeteria or maybe in in street. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, thank you. Move to the church. Uh, maybe I think church slide. Do you still know on the camera thing? I think it's enough, maybe just two slides, I think. Okay. Okay. Yes, all. Okay, uh, Mr. Manot and Mr. Pozali, uh, will you like to main room? Because we uh, we want to is we want to give you the certificate in the main room. Uh to uh, better with the and Mr. Mrs. Angela Romano from the other station and Ms. Yurina Guzman. So like that we want to give your sure. certificate. Thank okay, you. Maybe Marcus, <laughs> yeah, you're all welcome, Mr. Manoj and Mr. Gosel also. Big big thank you for both of you as speaker today in this session. Okay. Uh how to can, um yes uh, uh, so we go back to the so yeah i got the main room yeah the okay. zoom administration will 
organize all back to the main room. Okay. Uh, See you in well. the main room. Okay. In it, in it. Recording in progress. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the main room. Now we are going to have an appreciation speech to the speakers that will be delivered by the head of Department of Communication, Ms. Kusmia Arianti, SAMSE, and the head of Department of International Relation, Mr. Shafiuddin Fadrila, BAMSE. First, to Ms. Kusmia Arianti, SAMSE, please give an appreciation speech to Dr. Angela Romano, and Mr. Gozali Munawar, LCMN. Thank you, Ibu Associate Professor Angela Romano, for your speech about democracy. This is a really essential issue to talk about and definitely we will enrich our knowledge on the subject. And uh, Mr. Gozali, communication development is considerable part of the country, uh, country's democracy. Thank you, Mr. Guzali, for sharing uh, your incredible insight on this topic. Thank you. All right, to Ms. Guzmia Ariadi and Dr. Angela Romano, please have a photo session together. Uh, be ready, I will count to three. One, two, three. Once again, one, two, and three. Next, to Ms. Gusmia and Mr. Gozali, please have a photo session together. All right. Okay. Please be ready to Ms. Gusmia and Mr. Gozali. Okay. I will count to three. One, two, Three, once again, one, two, three. Okay, thank you. And now moving to Mr. Shafiuddin Fadlila, BAMSE. Please give an appreciation speech to Dr. Manoj Kumar Panigrahi and Ms. Yuherina Guzman, SIPMA. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Septi. Uh, I express the deep appreciation uh, to a great speaker today in International Symposium. Uh, thank you very much for Dr. Uh, Manoj Kumar uh, and Ms. Yuherina Guzman. Thank you for your uh, time, attention, knowledge, energy today. And please accept our thanks certificate. Thank you very much then and, and good luck. Thank you. Uh, now to Mr. Shaf and Dr. Manoj. Please have a photo session together. Okay, be ready. And I will count to three. One, two, three. Once again, one, two, three. Moving to Mr. Shafiuddin and Ms. Yuherina. Please be ready on your screen. I will count to three. One, two, three, once again, one, two, three. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, before we continue to our agenda, to all the participants, please open your camera because we're going to have a session together. Okay.
All right, be ready. I will count to three, starting from the first slide. One, two, three. Once again, one, two, three. Moving to the next slide. Please open your camera. Be ready. One, two, three. Once again, one, two, three. The next slide. Please open your camera. One, two, three. Okay, once again, one, two, three. The next slide. Please open the camera. One, two, three. Once again, one, two, three. The next slide. One, two, three. Once again, one, two, three. The next. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the next agenda, we're going to have a talk show and student presentation that will be led by moderator, Mr. Fahmi Ibrahim, SOS MIKOM. Mr. Fahmi, please take over the next event. Thank you very much, Shapti. I hope my voice can be here clearly. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah be with you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, students and all participants. Welcome to this special session, which is a part of talk show from our alumni and student presentation. We have two guests joining with us this afternoon. Uh, let me introduce them to you, Iqbal and Gilang. How are you guys? <clears throat> Iqbal and Gilang, have you, uh, have you joined us? Hello, Hello yes, I'm here. Okay, Iqbal and Gilang, thank you for joining us. Uh, nice to Zoom meet you both, yeah, because we're doing this uh, via Zoom. We also have uh, with us two students presenters and a word from our students' council representatives, which I will introduce them later on. But uh, let's start this session in a very good moment. I can see the, there are 354 participants still joining us. Hope you all stay uh, till the end, yeah. First... I would like to introduce Muhammad Iqbal Tawakal. Yes. Okay. He graduated in uh, 2009 from the Department of Communication. And he is now working as a PJ or video journalist at Nippon Hoso Kyokai, or uh, as we know, NHK. And before that, he had experience with uh, Metro TV as a camera person. 12 years of experience as a videographer brings him to many projects in Indonesia and international. Yeah. Iqbal Tawakal, how are you, brother? Nice I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Thank you for having okay. me. Okay, uh, so Iqbal, uh, before mm -hmm. we go to uh, Gilang, yeah, you've been working yeah. with NHK for how many years? Okay, uh, before that, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <coughs> So, yeah, uh, I've been working for uh, NHK since 2014. So now it means total already more than eight years uh, I'm working for the NHK. Okay, and how did this opportunity knock really? Uh, what's the story? How can you join NHK? Okay, that's the uh, interesting story actually. So one time when I uh, was in uh, Metro TV, one of my friends uh, sharing info in the WhatsApp group. This is what I want to talk to you guys that uh, please do not underestimate even a little info that shared by your friend because it could, it could be the, the uh, destiny for you in the future because 
the info that shared to me from my friend. So it's the job opportunity for NHK as a video journalist at the time. So I, actually, I have no idea about NHK at the time. Just nothing to lose. Just submit it. Uh, submit the 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 uh, NHK in 2014, and then the yeah, lucky for me, and I got hired. Yeah, of course, after the several step and the uh, exam. Yeah, for for that. Yeah, any, any differences and experience you want to share with us, uh, Iqbal? I mean, the journalist culture, working habit in Indonesia compared to the Japan media, of course. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, it's uh, some of different between uh, local, I mean, the national media and Japanese media. For the Japanese media, uh, discipline is important. I mean, the time is important. There is no place for being late. There is no reason for being late. I mean, you must be for discipline in terms of the time. Your for example, yeah. yes, of course. Uh, uh, for example, if you uh, have appointment at nine, for example, you have to be in the office 30 minutes before. Oh. At least five, at 8.30, you have to be in the office. So and, you here, cannot... and here we uh, will be in the office 30 minutes after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Because so many factors, right? <laughs> Today is no problem. Okay, continue, please. Mm, so, uh, and then also the different things from the uh, national media about the content, about the issue that what we have, uh, what we need to cover. In national media, maybe we can cover, uh, we can cover uh so many uh, local issue, yeah. But uh, in the NHK, we only focus to the uh, international uh, issue. For example, like uh, presidential elections, international summit, uh, G20, IMF, yeah, for uh, for that like uh, international issue, like that. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you actually do uh, as a PJ video journalist uh, there? So basically, VJ, uh, video journalist and cameraman is not so much different. But for the video, video journalist, you have some uh, more responsibilities. Mm. Uh, for example, before you go for the coverage, you have to do some research. What do you want to cover? What do you want to be on air? So you have to research by yourself. And then when you go to the coverage, also you have to uh, sometimes you you need to go by yourself okay. because uh, maybe some of the reporters or the your colleagues in the office maybe they also uh, busy so you have to go by yourself and then okay. the, after the uh, coverage uh, the post production I have to uh, editing to do the editing of the footage that I have uh, taken so be because in Tokyo I mean in Japan. Uh, none of them, maybe yeah, some of them understand with Bahasa because we also hire the uh, Indonesian people in Tokyo. Oh, but yeah, but uh, we have to decide. I mean, if, if we already interview for someone, like an mm -hmm. uh, important person, we have to cut which statement that we will use to be on air. Oh. That's why we have to cut by ourselves and then, then send it to Tokyo. Then and we'll be on air uh, from Tokyo. Like that. Okay. Uh, um, what learning and impressions taking during college? You've been working uh, in local media and also international, right? So, mm -hmm. what learning and impressions uh, have you taken from from college? Yeah, uh, it's uh, interesting. The thing that I can take from study in the uh, Universitas Al Azhar Indonesia, the campus teach us the manners. And this has oh, become very useful for us. When you are in the midst of society, uh, how you behave and talk. And I think this is very uh, exp expensive thing that we already get from uh, UAE. Yeah, actually. I think discipline is also an important thing. Yeah. Especially and also another thing that uh, I can learn from uh, UAE at the time, I still remember until now, you have Oh. If you want to go to campus, if you want to go uh, study, you have to wearing well dressed. Oh, well dressed. Yeah. Because if you only use the t-shirt, 
you will be kicked out. You cannot okay. be in gate inside. <laughs> Okay. There's someone like a task force in front of the gate. They will deny you, so you cannot get inside because you were in t-shirt. Yeah, yes. you have to be polite. Yeah, they are really yes, yes, right? yes, indeed. Okay. Yes. So, what's your next plan? Uh, still in the industry, or you want to take other challenges? Mm, so far, I don't. I, mm, I don't think. You have no idea. Yeah. Yeah, I have no idea. Uh-huh. But let's see in the future. Actually, this is a good, uh, good question. Actually, yeah, I think we're enjoying the media industry. <laughs> yeah, if yeah. I have another opportunity, maybe why not? Okay, but don't go anywhere, Iqbal, because uh, we have other alumni to introduce. Yeah, sure. uh, and coming yeah. Iqbal is Gilang Punto Wahyu Aji. Uh, Gilang Wahyu Punto Aji, Pak. Gilang wa- Gilang Wahyu Punto Aji. Oh, yes, sir. Okay, this is the long name. What? How should I call you? Uh, Gilang, Gilang. Oh, Gilang. You can call me by Gilang. Okay, okay. Let me introduce uh, Gilang first. Yeah, currently uh, Gilang is working at Political Cooperation Division Two Officer at ASEAN Secretariat. He graduated in uh, 2011, alumni of International Relations, and a Master of Diplomacy from Australian National University. Hi, Gilang. How are you? Alhamdulillah, Pak. I'm doing very good. Uh, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me. Well, it's nice to have you here. Uh, your background is international relations, right? And yep. and now you're working in international environment, which is mm-hmm. ASEAN Secretariat. So dreams do come true, yeah? Is this your dream, really? Working in ASEAN Secretariat? Um, I think uh, ASEAN has been one, one of my goals um, during college because um, I think uh, every IR student, um, they want to become a diplomat or work at an, and at an international uh, organization when they graduate. So um, yeah, so this is one of my dreams that um, has come true. But it's been a long journey because I, I didn't um, go to uh, ASEAN. Wow. After I, I graduate, I had to um, take a post-grad uh, degree first, then they accepted me at, um, in ASEAN. Oh, I see. So tell us more about how first uh, you joined ASEAN Secretariat. I actually uh, applied through the uh, job uh, vacancy that they uh, uh, advertise uh, um, on the website. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, that's the only way uh, to join um, through the open recruitment. Okay, so uh, mm-hmm. probably we also want to know your daily activities uh, in political cooperation. Okay, um, so I'm um, at ASEAN. Um, the work at ASEAN is um, always um, doing meetings and deliberations, musyawarah dan rapat um, between uh, the secretary and 10 countries. So uh, in uh, in my field, um, we have to um, see and try to um, follow up the meetings uh, in the issues, um, which is uh, under our uh, purview. Uh, for, for example, um, I'm dealing with the issues of the Myanmar coup. Okay. Which is um, yeah, which is um yet to be resolved right now. So um those issues um need to be discussed at uh multiple levels of uh, meetings. Um starting from some the senior uh, official meetings, yeah. and then the for the foreign foreign minister meetings and the um and the, and the ASEAN summit. So it's like a three level of meetings that the issues needs to be discussed and needs to be resolved. So I see, I see. yeah, very interesting, yeah, <clears throat> very very interesting. And uh, in this area, everywhere in the world, digital is becoming very much part of our life, right? Mm-hmm. Take yeah. our smart gadget. It's what we do first thing in the morning. Yeah. What are the benefits and te- challenges uh, you see here for Indonesia generation? I think the benefit is that um we can um obtain the information uh in a re- real time manner, uh, mm-hmm. uh very quickly. But the challenges is that we have to uh, use our judgment to actually judge which uh, information is uh, relevant to our work and which uh, information is uh, appropriate that we can pass on to our colleagues and pass on to our uh, superiors and supervisors because not uh, every uh, not every uh, information can be used for our environment. So yeah, we have to use our judgment and our mm. our our uh, critical thinking from college to select the uh, uh, information needed. Yeah, well, there are so many layers here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. understand. Yeah. Okay, uh, talking about college, what's uh, your favorite subject 
when you were in Al Azhar? Uh, my favorite subject, if I re remember correctly, I think it, mm. uh, it had something to do with. Uh, I think it was methodology in IR or or something like that. Um, it was about uh, studying all of the uh, paradigms um, oh. uh, in in IR, starting from classic realism to uh, post structural or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because you love uh, international relation, whatever uh, fits you around international yeah. relations. Yeah, I was it. kind of like a theory, uh, theory guy, you know, during college. But um, when I um started to work, to work, I I I decided to become more practical than less the theoretical. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, what's your contribution, aims, or goals in uh, near future, Dylan? Uh, I plan, well, uh, actually now in ASEAN, um, I work for, for 10 governments, for 10 member states. In the future, I would like to become a government official and work for my own uh, government in the field of foreign affairs. And yeah, uh, hopefully that can come true one day. Oh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And by the way, in ASEAN Secretariat, uh, are there more young employees rather than the senior? I think it, uh, it depends on the level of employment that you are uh, trying to apply. Like for like for example, um, I'm um, I'm at the first layer. I'm at the okay. I am currently an officer. Uh, above me is a senior officer and head of a division, and director, uh, deputy secretary general, and then the secretary general. So I think um, I think uh, at the officers level, um, they are they are about um, my age, like uh, mm -hmm. mid twenties, uh, early thirties. Most are like uh, postgraduate students, and and um, uh, the the uh, you you get older when when you become like the head of division and and onwards. More youngsters means uh, they they all are digital savvy. No issue on that part, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, this is for Gilang and Iqbal. Actually, the question is: When were you last visit Alazar? Actually. It's been more than ten years. <laughs> I think the last time was 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 before I left to Australia. I think I left to Australia in twenty seventeen. Huh? I think I last visited when I was, yeah. I think uh, it was in twenty fifteen. I think. Twenty fifteen. <laughs> okay, yeah. it was a long time ago. What about yeah. you, uh, Iqbal? So actually, uh, it was uh, last June actually. Oh, last, so, last June. Last June, yeah. Uh, at the time, uh, one of the uh, broadcasting lectures, uh -huh. uh, Mas Hafiz, okay. inviting me to join with the session uh, class, same okay. like today, but uh, uh, in person uh, to the uh, campus at the time. So lucky I'm coming to the campus again at the time. So, so okay. Okay, uh, more to a uh, guest lecturer, probably, yeah. Well, yeah. Yep. Okay, so you probably know uh, Kantin Layang, yeah, because it's near our campus, because <laughs> I don't yeah. think Gilang knows it. Yeah, at the time, I just, a uh, surprise for me, because that was the first time for me to see the Kantin Layang, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally different since I uh, last my visit to uh, OIE. Yeah, usually you come to a uh, usual canteen here at the campus, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, both of you, Gilang and Iqbal, yeah, brings good name to Al Azhar in Indonesia University as an alma mater. Anything you want to say for the younger generation who are willing to follow in your footsteps? Gilang, probably. Gilang, first. Okay, um, uh, I think um, one of my best advice is um, try to have a, a high. Uh, ambition because if you fall then you don't fall very low no. like uh for, for example um if, if you want to work at a good place at a prestigious place um yeah um try your your, your best to uh, to achieve it and um don't try to settle for a second best because you have the ability you have the uh the means to do it so yeah i think now it's very easy to learn English, to learn uh, anything. Uh, it's available on the you know, on Google and everything. So I think the next the the next generation will be much more better than I am. So yeah. Yeah, hopefully. What about you, Iqbal? 
So I just want to say to my friend in the campus in uh, university student now, uh, please do anything uh, you like. I mean, please do, please improve your skill. Please, please gain your skill. This is this is the time. I mean, if you already, uh, if you graduated and you join with the one company, uh, especially you are the fresh graduated. Uh, maybe the company will uh, will see you, will uh, following you from your attitude, from your uh, uh, skill. So please don't be fail. If you want to, if you want to fail, this is the time. So yeah, do it anything what you want. If you want to do some, uh, if you want, if you want to make like uh, some event, please. If you like uh, some photography or video editing, this is the time. Just do it. Improve your skill and gain your skill. Get the experience. That's the important. Thank you. Okay, I think this is the younger generation's time. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, you have to use it maximum as you can. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Iqbal and Gilang. You're welcome. I think your you, words sir. says them all. Yeah, positive thank motivation. You. Thank you. Welcome. Students want to reach uh, their goals. Again, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Uh, we'll be seeing you in near uh, future, hopefully. Thank, thank you, Bapak. Thank you. Thank Bapak. you. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Okay. okay, now we go to the next session. A presentation from uh, two students sharing their paper regarding rural tourism development and the other one about the foreign terrorist fighters. First, uh, we have Raihan Muhammad Farhan. Assalamualaikum, Raihan. Waalaikumsalam, Mr. Fahmi. Okay, let me introduce you to the participant first. Yeah, uh, Raihan is a student from... Uh, Al Azhar University now in the seventh semester, majoring in public relations, and he have published article at Sinta Dua and awarded as the best paper presenter at Jakarta Communication Conference. The topic he's going to present is uh, rural tourism development through community-based tourism or CBT in Sumber Gondo Village, Malang. So without further delay, and I'll give the screen seven minutes to you, Raihan, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Fahmi, for the introduction. Please allow me to share my presentation. I hope my present presentation is visible. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, honorable ladies and gentlemen. I am very honored to be part of this momentous event to commemorate the 20th year of the establishment of the Faculty of Social and Political Sciences, Universitas Al-Azhar, Indonesia. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Raihan Farhat, one of the students here uh, studying communication major in public relations. It is with great pleasure that I can present one of the social research that Mrs. Manik Sudwantari and I did back in July. We presented this research paper at the second international conference on communication science in Lombok a few months ago, and I would like to present it again to you all today. This research is titled Rural Tourism Development Through Community-Based Tourism in Sumbergondo Village, Malang. Without further ado, I would like to start the presentation. As an archipelago country, Indonesia has an abundant amount of natural and cultural potential. The unique characteristics of Indonesia are spread through thousands of islands and lay characteristically in every area in, of Indonesia. The ultimate and vast diversity is well known to be why tourists visit Indonesia. Tourists can experience their genuine and authentic spectrum in almost all villages or rural areas, as you can see here in the presentation. Based on the Indonesian uh, Statistical Yearbook, there are as many as 80,000 villages scattered throughout Indonesia, and every single one of them has the potential to become a tourist area with the proper implementation of tourist planning. That's why the Minister of Tourism in Indonesia stated that tourist village offers a different atmosphere that reflects the country's side authenticity, either from the layout, the architecture of the buildings, as well as the social and cultural life of the society. Government can develop village tourism by ensuring the empowerment of the villagers from the social and economic aspects. Since its development is density, 
it is crucial to ensure collaboration and assistance from stakeholders. To empower the villagers, stakeholders must look and implement a suitable method that is scientifically proven to be effective. For example, a developed country like Spain has, its, has made its uh, tourism sector its leading economic power by implementing a method called community-based tourism. Whilst uh, in Indonesia, there are four different village characteristics based on their development and abilities. The first one is traditional villages, or in Indonesia, it's called desa tradisional. The second one is self-supporting villages, or desa swasembada. The third one is self plentiful village, or desa swadaya. And the fourth one is self-sufficient village, or desa swadarma. And one of the village that has succeeded in forming a tourist village by implementing the community-based method is Sumbergondo Village in Batu, Malang City. Sumbergondo Village has established four main tourist sites, utilizing their unique natural and cultural potential. We want to know the parties involved, their parts, and the communication being built in the process of empowering the community in this research. We hope that the, re the research uh, discography and that discovery can help other potential villages, especially in Indonesia, that have not uh, succeeded in turning villages into tourist destinations. In our research, we examine deeply of the communication network, the role of each element, and how the community can synergistically combine these roles into Burgono Village as a tourist village. We conducted on-site observation and continued our research by interviewing several key informants. The key informants were the community, the government, Department of Communication and Information, and Kim Wartamertani. And what we found that the first step of turning a village into a tourist village is to recognize its unique characteristics. Sumbergondo has potential because of the area's unique characteristics. As you can see here in the picture, Sumbergondo has a very rich culture and natural, natural potential have succeeded in turning the village into a self-sufficient village. And with the characteristics of the natural structure of the village, the community has succeeded in establishing three tourist sites. The first one is Pusung Lading Mountain Adventure. The second one is Blagah Camping Ground. And the last one is Tegondo Cafe. And then with the unique characteristics of the culture, the village community succeeded in forming an educational tour named Creative Sumbergondo. The next one is Community Information Group, named Kim Warta Martani, has many roles in the effective communication formed in Sumbergondo. This coming for of Malang City ensures that Kim Warta Martani can become an agent of change. This is the key word. By providing information management training, ranging from reporting, processing to dissemination information to the public. And then Kim Warta Martani utilized digital media of, for the information dissemination process. And one of them is Village TV. And I'm currently researching the Village TV program that the city has established to promote the rural branding for community empowerment. And the last one is the actors involved in the village communication. The first one is the village government. The second one is Karang Taruna Group. And then there is Mount Arjuna Exploration Community named Jaguar, Farmer Women's Group, Family Welfare Empowerment Groups, or PKK. Kim Warta Martani, and then the main element is the Sumbergondo village community. The synergy is formed with the culture of kinship and cooperation. The value of kinship in, is formed from a family culture continuously communicated by Kim Warta Martani as a social group. Uh, as stated by uh, Mrs. Angela uh, in the previous session, that community holds a very important part in the development of an area. This research also concludes that. And with the discovery of the process of the communication between elements that are formed, our findings can help elements that, are for, that have not been able to take advantage of their tourism potential by implementing the community-based method to successfully become self-sufficient villages and increase the number of tourist sites in Indonesia. So it can help Indonesia strengthening the tourist sector as one of our tremendous economic strengths. That's it for me for now. If you have any questions, please you can contact me directly. I will share my contact information in the chat box. 
thank you very much. And I will give the floor back to Mr. Fahmi. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Raihan, for the presentation. Participants can send questions regarding the paper to Raihan's email, and uh, I think it's already shared at the chat box. Yeah. Okay, now we continue with uh, Yolanda Tasha Amalia. Assalamualaikum, Yolanda. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Mr. Fahmi. Okay, you're ready for your presentation? Yes. Okay, but let me introduce you first, yeah. Yolanda is a Bachelor of Political Science, just graduated this year from International Relations. And uh, she had experience in student association and youth social organizations. And she also won second place of a Diskusi Ilima National Paper Competition held by the Forum Komunikasi HI Indonesia. She will present a topic, the refusal policy of the repatriation of foreign terrorist fighters or FTFs in Indonesia, human security dilemma. Without waiting any longer, we welcome Yolanda. Approximately seven minutes to you, uh, Yolanda. The screen is yours. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fahmi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, distinguished guests and participants. First of all, uh, thank you for having me. I feel so honored to be one of the speakers for today's International Symposium. My name is Yolanda Tasha Maria from International Relations Department. And what I'd like to present to you today is the refusal policy of the repatriation of foreign terrorist fighters in Indonesia, human security dilemma. This was originally a competition essay made by my partner, Fikri Ashari and me for Grand Essay Academy. In this essay, we talk about some terrorist groups called the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS, and how they impact the human security of both combatants and citizens of Indonesia. I believe most of us have seen this news where in 2020, Indonesian government decided not to accept Indonesian citizens who join ISIS networks abroad, considering such repatriation would have carried the risk of error and make Indonesian citizens feel unsafe. At that time, when the ISIS caliphate was officially declared collapsed by the Syrian democratic forces, had an impact on the phenomenon of FTF returnees or foreign terrorist combatants who returned to their home countries. But responding to this refusal policy, there are cons regarding the citizenship status and human rights of the FTFs. Both pros and cons of this issue, we reveal the human security concept. In international relations, the concept of human security refers to security which has a core in human themselves, and it requires the active involvement of society and the state in realizing the human security entirely. The pro side highlights the national security of the Indonesian nation for a safe and low best life for each of its citizens. Repatriation of FTF to Indonesia challenged the pluralistic value and only increases the feeling of insecurity for society in the future. ISIS ideology, which is relevant to the approach of coercion, violence, and feels the state as an enemy is contrary to Pancasila and the principle of diversity that unites Republic of Indonesia. As we all know, since 2016, Indonesia has been hit by several bomb attacks on behalf of ISIS and claimed a total of hundreds of lives, such as Tam Tamrin bombing, uh, Kampung Rayu bombing, and the Surabaya bombing. Even there are presence of a number of extremist groups in Indonesia affiliated with ISIS, such as Jamaah Ansarut Daulah, Jamaah Ansarut Tawid, Mujahid Indonesia Timur, and others. Now, it, it is also said that ex-ISIS is not Indonesian citizens anymore, considering they burn their passport as the symbolic action. And according to citizenship law and government regulation, ex-ISIS has entered a foreign army or being a rebel group in a country. So they already lost their, city, their Indonesian citizenship. 
Now, the refusal policy, also an implementation of deterrence as regulated in immigration law, where ex-ISIS has involved in a transnational crimes. So, Minister of Indonesia is responsible to maintain security and public order, which is carried out based on immigration reasons. On the other side, the cons focus more on the humanitarian rights of these former IC supporters. They don't get the right to a decent life as written in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights because of their stateless condition. But there is ambiguity regarding the Article 23 of citizenship law, namely foreign army service and foreign country. Considering in international relations, terrorists actually such as ISIS uh, are not state actors. This position makes ex-ISIS supporters unable to immediately be said to have joined the army of foreign country and thus lost their citizenship. The refusal policy also is not in line with law number five year 2018, as it regardless defines that all of Indonesian citizens who join ISIS are dangerous combatants and threaten Indonesia's national security. Right? The policy is unfair because it does not consider what role each individual carries. In fact, there are some who just support ISIS without being combatant or become victims of brainwashing, and not to mention the family members, such as wives and children, who are forced to follow the head of family. Another consequence is the increasing number of refugees in the world, as seen in uh, overcrowded, overcrowded Al Hol, Al Roj, and in Isaket, that can actually backfire on the state. For example, like the longer Indonesian citizens are left in the camp, they may grow more radical, be scared to enter illegally to Indonesia, and even pose more threat for Indonesia's future. So my partner and I conducted a simple questionnaire with two short questions. Uh, do you agree if FT apps are not returned to Indonesia, and why do you think so? The result is 67% is agreed and 32% disagree. This shows the pros and cons have been still ongoing in society today. So there is urgency for a more comprehensive study by policymakers. But Indonesia as part of the international community is still obliged to respect the rights to citizenship by upholding the principle of exhaustion of local remedies, meaning national legal mechanisms are prioritized for determining the citizenship status for former IC supporters. The alternatives are establishing a joint judiciary between the national court and international court or going directly to international criminal court. No less important is the willingness of individuals to not repeat their actions as well as the certainty of the state to provide their radicalization programs up to entrepreneurship training so that these individuals can survive. So in dealing with the issue of FTF repatriation, it's essential to provide solution that place the protection of human rights of uh, ex-IC supporters into a fair balance with the protection of national security. Also, it is also important to make the community aware of this issue because Government policies only will be able to run optimally with the full support of the entire community. And that brings us to the end of presentation. I sincerely appreciate your attention today. And thank you for the opportunity for presenting my essay competition experience with my partner. Bilahi Taufik Wal Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yolanda's presentation is uh, interesting as well. Please give your email via chat box, uh, Yolanda, in order for the participants to send questions or any concerns directly to you. Okay, thank you very much, Yolanda. Thank Two you, presenters uh, just give an interesting point of view from their side regarding tourists and terrorists. Both sounds alike, eh? tourists and terrorists. <laughs> Again, thank you, uh, Raihan and Yolanda. Before we end, there is one more session from our student council representative, Ahmad Rafi will share his experience as a student council. Assalamualaikum, Rafi. Waalaikumsalam, Mr. Fahmi. Okay, Rafi, the time is yours. Okay. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Your honorable guests, committees, and also moderator, uh, I would like to say thank you for having me 
first and foremost, uh, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Rafi, and today I would like to share my experience uh, so far as a proud student that is part of this great faculty at the University of Al Azhar, Indonesia. Okay. As I've mentioned before, uh, my full name is Ahmad Rafi, and I'm currently 20 years old. I'm currently majoring in international relations at Faculty of Social and Political Science Universitas Al Azhar Indonesia, batch 2020, where we are consist of 44 students and part of a big family of our faculty, that is Faculty of Social and Political Science at University of Al Azhar Indonesia. For batch 2020 itself, it consists of approximately 300 students combining my major and also our brothers and sisters from the communication uh, major that's only just from my batch not to mention our other family from other batches so studying in university of al azhar indonesia is not only about uh, living our academics life but also joining student organizations for this period i'm joining uh, our beloved keluarga mahasiswa visip or km visip uh, for short not to mention, we also have uh, two other student organizations who are synergized with us called Corps Mahasiswa HI or Komahi from the IR major and also Corps Mahasiswa Ilmu Komunikasi uh, from Comic or for short uh, from the communication major. So uh, what is KMVSIP? So KMVSIP stands for Keluarga Mahasiswa Fakultas Ilmu Sosial dan Ilmu Politik Universitas Al Azhar Indonesia, or for short is KMVSIP YI. So which translates into students' families of Faculty of uh, Social and Political Studies. It is a student organization made by the students from the Faculty of Social and Political Science from University of Al Azhar Indonesia. So. We are a student organization or student council, you might say, where we try to accommodate uh, this big family of our faculty. We try to accommodate our students' interests and also their aspirations. Based on our name, our core values uh, is based on family ties between us. So as you can see on this slide, we have our organization structure that is led by our BOD that consists of our chairman, vice chairman, two secretaries and also two treasurers. We elect our chairman and vice chairman once a year through a direct election democratically. The BRD are also have nine departments to help achieve our goals. Uh, there are strategic and study, uh, studies, strategic studies and actions, public relation, audiovisual, special event, and then business development, talent and interest, inventory, research and human resources development, and also social and community. Okay, uh, there are a lot of uh, work programs that can receive made to accommodate our students, such as national seminar, uh, fiber, which is an abbreviation that we made uh, from FISIP Berbakti, which translate to FISIP Devote where we devote ourselves to help improve villages that are in need. And there are also FISIP Week, FISIP Sport League, and many more. Okay, so how do we contribute ourselves? There are a lot of things that you can explore as a student, uh, as part of a KM FISIP member. First, studying on the dynamics of social and political issues. By studying on today's issues showed that we contribute ourselves on today's challenges and also help to raise the awareness to others. I believe that we studied our, what we studied, our knowledge that are useful to others. Therefore, just by studying on today's uh, vast challenges, either social or even political challenges or issues has contributed ourselves on society. Second, uh, it will be, be a part of any kinds of work programs that has been provided. By joining various of programs or projects that are available helps other uh, people to achieve their curiosity that they are invested to. 
there's this saying that lingers where on becoming the best person in society is by being useful to others. By helping to accommodate others is showing your, ourselves to be the best on society. Uh, last but not least, uh, we tend to socialize and make bonds with others. I believe that by building a good connection is one of many ways to achieve success. Bonds that are made by trust are the best types of bond people can achieve. We'll never know what types of opportunities that we're about to face and those opportunities could be given by people that you make bonds with. We all know that hundreds of friends are too few and one uh, enemy is too many. So uh, last but not least, I would like to share something what I have learned so far. So uh, currently I'm on my fifth semester. Uh, maybe I'm too young to share what lesson that I learned and also I'm still on my studies but uh, one thing is all I know is that the key of living is by having a will to learn and also contributing ourselves to society even by the smallest sets of action maybe uh, that is all for me my sincere apologies if there was any forms of mistakes or misspoken words thank you and that's me Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rafi, for sharing the console. Uh, well, that concludes our session. Again, thank you for uh, Iqbal, Gilang, Raihan, Rolanda, and Rafi for your precious time. Stay safe and keep healthy. I'm Fahmi Ibrahim, ending the session, and I hand this over back to Septi, our Master of Ceremony. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Fahmi Ibrahim. Ladies and gentlemen, we are continuing to our next agenda about the winner announcement for student competition. Now we invite Mr. Yudo Sambodo SOS MSE to hand the certificate and give a short speech to the winners of speech competition, then to the winners of the short movie competitions. Thank you uh, for Kaka Septi to give me a chance to announce a uh, winner for student competition. But at uh, the first time, I would say to thanks for committee as a student council, COMIC, COMAHI, and KFVSIP to has announced, about, organized this competition. And now I will announce the winner. Uh, I will show the... <clears throat> And then <clears throat> for third winner, Lomba Short Movie awarded to Rania Safira Azahra from SMA Muhammadiyah, Jakarta. Congratulations. And then second winner for Lomba Short Movie awarded to Agastya Adrian Shahluna from SMK Negeri 40 Jakarta. And at the first winner for Lomba Short Movie awarded to Bayu Surya Wirayuda from SMK Negeri 1 Kota Bekasi. Congratulations to all winner for Lomba Short Movie. And then I will announce for Lomba Pidato. For third winner is Hona Kauri Elisia from SMA Islam Al Azhar 22 Cikarang. Congratulations. And second winner is Adam Aulia Manjal Khan from SMA Muhammadiyah Bat Jakarta. And the first winner is Adinda Mutiara Azahra from SMK Negeri Satu Kota Bekasi. Congratulations for the all winner. I hope we can meet again in other competition. Thank you for your join and I will say congratulations again.
Thank you for Mr. Septi. Time is back to you. Okay, to Mr. Yudo and the three winners of short movies, Bayu Surya Wira Yuda, Agasta Adrian Sahlona, and Rania Safira Azahra. Please have a photo session together. Be ready and I will count to three. To Bayu Surya Wira Yuda, please open your camera because you're going to have a photo session with Mr. Yudo Sambudo. Okay. Bayu Surya Wirayuda, can you please open your camera? Yes, yes, yes. Please. <laughs> Bayu, ready? Okay, I will count to three. One, two, three. Once again, one, two, three. Okay, thank you, Bayu. Yeah, thank you very much. Congratulations, Bayu. Ah, I give one. Um, next for winners of speech competition, Adinda Mutiara Azahra, Adam Aulia Manzalhan, dan Pona Kauri Elisha. Please open your camera and be prepared for the photo session. Adinda Mutiara Azahra. Okay. Mr. Yudo Scream. All right. You ready? I will count to three. One, two, three. Once again, one, two, three. Thank you, Adinda. The next one is Adam Aulia Manzalhan. I'm here. Okay. You ready? I will count to three. One, two, three. Once again, one, two, three. All right, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Congratulations, Adam. The last one, um, Pona Kauri Alicia. Pona, Pona, are you ready? Yes. Okay, I will. Three. One, two, three. Okay, once again, one, two, and three. Thank you, Fona and Mr. Yudo. Now we're going to the next agenda and uh, we invite the head of the committee of today's event, Mrs. Soraya Esos MSE to give the closing remarks.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dana Rabel Rektor of University Al Azhar Indonesia, Profesor Dr. Insinyur Asep Saifuddin MSG, the Honorable Vice Rector of University Al Azhar Indonesia, the Honorable Supervisory Council Mr. Suhadi, Inspector and Inspectors of Yayasan Nusantara Insya Al Azhar, the Honorable Kenneth Speaker Professor Ang Pengwa, the Honorable US Embassy from US Embassy Mr. Joshua Stankus, the Honorable Parallel Session Speakers, the Honorable Members and Delegation from the Foreign Embassy Indonesian Parliamentary Council, governments and state and also private institution and uh, the uh, institutional and media partner US Embassy and KBR Radio 68H, deans, directors, and lecturers of Universitas, Universitas al Azhar Indonesia and from other universities, home and abroad, academia, academic community, media, and all participants. The development of technology and society has created degradation in humanity in the era of information, communication, and technology, or ICT. Democracy and public participation, digital age, and various of digital themes that supported development and democracy in the world has become trend of social and political research nowadays. Social science has become the backbone and rise to political reorientation, redefinition of sociopolitics, the reorientation, and reconstruction of meaning towards development paradigm has become essential and much required issue to discuss. The media has power to influence the audience through representation of social reality. As Marshall mentioned in his book that the nomadic communication or mobility communication is the character of new human communication pattern. It is characterized by digital media with three dimension, public rather than private, handle on demand and self-expression and articulation of self-identity. Media effect on humanity and societal life, such as a virtual identity, citizen journalism, creativity, participatory media cultures, digital politics, cyber learning, e-marketing, and as well as the digital gap, cyber crime, cyber bullying, and negative aspect, it, it, is, it is present with the, the, the development of the media, the concept of algorithm being the basic character cover our daily life. Social media is so ignorant, ignorant in our culture, there is no daily activity for the majority of people across the globe. An algorithm, or, an algorithm is a mathematical set of rules specifying how a group of data behaves. In social media, algorithms help maintain order and assist in ranking search result. It creates the new life, new face, and relations in society, including the virtual reality, augmented reality, and etc. The 5.0 war brings new challenging to human, as well as to the educational research focus, social, political ethics, and rule of law. As the mentioned by our keynote speaker before, Professor Ang Pengwa, the algorithm will have influence in our life, such as short circuit our democratic process. In this point, as the academic community, we could not be separated ourselves from the dynamic of technological and societal issue, especially, especially about the digital war, the algorithm war, and the algorithm war. This is created and provoke us to the idea to bring the wide and difficult discussion of that issues in the formal academic forum that we name as the International Symposium Development and Democratization in Algorithm War. 2022. On the other hand, as the educational institution, we celebrate our faculty in this 20th anniversary this year. We are so grateful and blessing, blessing and want to share the chair, of the chair of momentum into the Indonesian society by this event. An Indonesian professor mentioned to me before when he gave his congrats to our faculty anniversary. I quoted him that the 20 year anniversary is a long note of journey with a lot and long impressive journey that both. I think he is right. It also means the existence of our faculty now cannot be separated from the all 20 years journey. So in this beautiful moment, we want to give our high appreciation to the all people whom had worked so hard to make our dream come true as one, as one of the best private university in Indonesia. 
As Sukarno, our Indonesian first president said that a great nation is a nation that respects its heroes. So that we want to give our high honor to the founding father of our Faculty of Social and Political Science, Universitas al Azhar Indonesia, Professor Dr. Yahya Mu'ah Muhaimin, as well as, as well as the other alcohol colleges whom still in UAE or has been gone or moved. Many thanks to all of you. And of course, some of them are joined here in this event. I said thank you to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, the honorable audiences and participants, we are so proud to accept you in our event. In our happiness, let me convey the number of participants who joined this Zoom meeting. This event, based on our data now, is attending almost about 500, 500 participant, participants at Zoom Room and more at our YouTube channel from over Indonesia and abroad. The participants are from a lot area in Indonesia, such as from Jabodetabek, Bandung, Bogor, Yogyakarta, Bengkulu, Maluku, Bosowa, Salatiga, East Java, Lampung, Malang, Palangkaraya, Banjarmasin, Lombok, Sulawesi, and etc. Also from abroad, from Singapore, China, Australia, America, and etc. The participants are come from campus, community, media, research center, government and state institution, local government too. The participant whom is attending this meeting got their information mostly about 59% from the professional and campus networking, around 18% from social media and broadcast, and about around 15% is from our invitation. It means, the data means that there are a lot of collaboration here. Together, we build the society between the campus, social society, civil society, and the public. Before I close this event, on behalf of my faculty and university, we give a high appreciation to the all speakers, presenters, moderators, and participants. Also, high appreciation to the all committee also, our appreciation to the all alumnus to and all committee who are so so amazing, and also our students. You all worked so hard to help this event. You are all great guys. Thank you so much, and hope God bless us. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi. Thank you, Mrs. Soraya, for the closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, our event today is supported by the U.S. Embassy, KBR Radio 68, Student Association at Visit UAE, KMF, Comic and Komahi, member of the Chancellor's Forum and member of the Dean's Forum in Indonesia. And now we have reached the conclusion of our event today. I hope you found today's evening, today's event informative and useful. Thank you for spending time with us today. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih semua teman-teman, semua alumni, semua mahasiswa Al-Azhar Indonesia. Para Masih Juan Turpin, Mahasiswa Al-Azhar Indonesia. Dan saya Yudinia Maharani, Mahasiswa Universitas Al-Azhar Indonesia. Pada kesempatan kali ini, kami akan mengajak kalian untuk berpilih di Universitas Al-Azhar Indonesia. Di sini, kalian bakal dapat banyak banget ilmu pengetahuan dan juga kelas yang sangat luas. Dengan berbagai produksi yang unggul, pengajar-pengajar yang profesional, hingga fasilitas yang unggul ini, kalian bisa menunjukkan kehidupan kalian di sini. Mulai dari konten kreatif. Kreator media, peneliti di lembaga terama hingga menjadi seorang entrepreneur muda. Para Aziz sudah hadir di sini. Kita untuk para dosen-dosen yang lain. Yuk berangkat. Semua ada Bu Monik, ada Bu Lestari, ada teman-teman dari kampus-kampus. Assalamualaikum Prof. Terima kasih. Bye-bye. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah baik Prof. Pada kemana nih? Mau ngajak calon mahasiswa untuk berkeliling di UAI Prof. Oh ini calon mahasiswa baru nih. Betul Prof. Tolong dianterin nih. Pasti Prof nanti kalau mau daftar di situ ya. Oke, siap, Prof. Selamat mendaftar ya. Ya, Assalamualaikum. Siap, Waalaikumsalam, Prof. Prof. Kalian tahu nggak sih, UAI itu salah satunya kampus yang terlahir dari masjid. Dan di UAI, terdapat 6 fakultas dengan 19 program studi yang bisa kalian pilih. 
Buat kalian nih yang suka banget sama teknologi, ilmu-ilmu alam, atau ingin terjun ke dunia sains tech, Fakultas Sains dan Teknologi merupakan pilihan yang tepat. Di dalamnya terdapat program studi teknik industri, teknik elektro, informatika, biologi, teknologi pangan, dan gizi. Fakultas ini juga dilengkapi dengan berbagai fasilitas laboratorium dukung loh. Mulai dari laboratorium manufaktur, laboratorium kimia, laboratorium elektro, laboratorium mikroorganisme, dan lab-lab yang berkaitan dengan sains teknologi lainnya. Fakultas berikutnya adalah Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis. Buat kalian yang mau masuk ke dunia bisnis dan keuangan, cocok banget nih. Ada program studi manajemen dan program studi...